Sydney, and welcome to Confused Reviews, where cartoon drawing reviews movies. I think we can all agree that 80s nostalgia has been squeezed for everything it's worth in the last decade. Every movie, novel, TV show, comic book character, and in our numbingly niche case, horror franchises. Whether Chucky, Pinhead, Evil Dead, even the fucking Children of the Corn just can't seem to stay dormant in the recesses of the pop culture hive mind. But what's even more horrifying is that now the original Scream is old enough to be nostalgic. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. 1996's Scream shouted past all expectations and box office records with its sleek direction from Wes Craven and tight, self-aware script from Kevin Williamson. It's a dynamic deconstruction of the genre while also pushing it forward after the 90s saw an enormous drop in quality and financial returns in slasher sequels. It's one of those movies that I find myself respecting more and more every time I revisit it. Then of course, Scream 2 came back with a vengeance less than a year later, matching its predecessor but swapping out cliches for comebacks and the troubles that arise when a movie is successful enough for another go-round. Oh, and did I mention they also practically made a bazillion dollars? So, yeah. Scream 3. With Y2K rapidly approaching, and Williamson off making I Know What You Did Last Summer, the criminally underrated The Faculty, teaching Miss Tingle, what the fuck? And some melodrama TV show with the kid from Varsity Blues. Ghostface found himself in a bit of an uncertain situation regarding a third outing. Audiences were still craving more. Thank you. But like I said, Kevin Williamson was all pens on deck with other projects, so while he stayed on to produce, Wes had to find another writer to replicate the magic and hopefully put a cap on the self-proclaimed final chapter of the Scream trilogy. Enter Aaron Kruger. No. Oh. Who has since gone on to draft movies varying from decent to dookie, dropped in to expand upon Williams's five-page treatment. Then in 2000, on the birthday of Adolf Hitler, <laughs> the Columbine Massacre happened. This threw the producers into a fucking frenzy, as the media desperately tried pinning this heinous atrocity on the oldest trick in the manipulation manual. Those darn rock and roll horror movie video games. To blame? More at 11. But I'm just not sure I fully understand why this compromised the tone and ability to make a serious movie. It's not like Ghostface is running around with guns and trench coats acting like the two biggest bitches ever squirted out of a cold Colorado cunt. It got so bad that even Wes had to step in and say, quote, Be serious, guys. Either we make a Scream movie or we make a movie and call it something else. But if it's a Scream movie, it's going to have certain standards. The movie follows Sydney, somewhat, but mostly Dewey and Gale, who are visiting the production of the in-universe stab saga as they too are ramping up on the third movie, just as the crew find themselves at the wrong end of a familiar foe's voice violator. So shout quiet on set and cut the landline as we dive into the least liked entry in this ever-expanding Screamiverse. I'm afraid if I don't answer the call fast enough, who knows how far past Scream 6 will be. This is Dewey and Gale's bogus journey. So the film begins with Cotton Weary, played once again by Liev Schreiber. Man, do both of those names suck. I guess Cotton is picked first for a phone call from the ghastly ghost face. You sound a lot like that guy on TV, um, uh, Cotton Weary. Or maybe not, as the fame-hungry fucker flirts with the female caller. I know you do. Only kidding, of course, it's our guy Ghostface, voiced once again by the guttural <coughs> god Roger L. Jackson. I'm right outside her bathroom door. The chivalrous celebrity springs into action, even though he was about to cheat on her 10 seconds ago. Cotton crashes through LA, which everyone knows really stands for LA traffic, and flies around like he's trying to be cast in Fast and Furious 15. At his place, Christine, played by Kelly Rutherford, hops out of a suitable slasher shower. It suddenly sounds like the former Fall Guy found his way home at the speed of sound. On your but I'm sure all you big boys and girls can connect the dots. Oh, hello there! Our killer plays footsies to the point I checked for Tarantino's name above the title, and Cotton convinces her he was just pulling her leg. Well, actually, I guess he was. Cotton crashes in and runs up to his pad like I do when I'm holding in a monumental shit. He weapons up rocking Ransom's rad sweater, but I think today would have been best if he wore his brown pants. 
He proves abysmal in a moment of conflict and crisis, causing his chick to get a Leatherface backshot. Poor Christine, a bigger tragedy than her chrome counterpart. They throw down, and as Cotton's carried into the afterlife, we reveal that this ghost face has the cheapest, weakest, and most magic MacGuffin bullshit I can recall from a big budget series. A voice modulator that can perfectly replicate these retards' voices with 100% clarity regardless of distance, volume, and the shelf neural. Anytime a character speaks on the phone or is placed where their face is obscured, it's a safe bet to assume it's this awfully stupid, overpowered appliance. I was hoping Cotton would go out fist fighting GF like he does in Goon. Now, you lose. Tell me your costume's at least made of cotton. It's a polyester blend. Flashing over to Sidney Prescott, portrayed for a three-peat by Nev Campbell, has been living as a hidden hermit, reclusive to the world, and this movie's screen time. She's currently holding it down as a crisis counselor because Sidney is simply too spectacular for such a shitty sequel. At least she had the whole compound camp of preparation 18 years before Lori Strode. Banging over to college, we see Courtney Cox's Gail Weathers teaching Horrible Haircuts 101. Damn, I messed up. We gotta go bald. <laughs> For a franchise full of cuts, this might be the fucking worst. These laughable locks are pretty much the only remnant of this movie I hear discussed nowadays, and I guess we can thank that lovable dipshit David Arquette. It's weird, sometimes I watch Scream 3 and I'm like, God, I don't, I don't like it. And sometimes I watch it and I'm like, oh, that's really kind of interesting. Who told his then wife to snip her shit into a style similar to Betty Page? A pinup model from when your grandpa was banging boomers. Break the rules. Did David cut them while they were fucking? The seminar stops before they start tossing the rotten fruit, and Weathers is warned by Kincaid, played by Patrick Dempsey, that Cotton's crushed. Do you have any idea who the girl might be? This is Marine Prescott. This is Sidney Prescott's mother. AKA our entire inciting incident. Speaking of incidents, we roll over to a Hollywood whack lot to reveal we're also involved in the Scream Universe's in-universe series Stab based on the Woodsboro whackings. Whack. Which has layers of meta that I'm not even sure human minds can grasp. This is the third movie, about making a third movie, within this reality going off course what's actually happened so far in canon where now a mysterious maniac shut down production of said movie to do his own killings, with that information stored on this physical disc that I have digitally stored on this computer, thus discussing it here in this YouTube video on the ever-expanding internet, wherefore a potential reaction channel can bust in and reassess that. Until 50 years from now, when our cybernetic, or communistic, or probably both, overlords forcibly astro-project it into your government-issued Coca-Cola, Apple, HBO Plus synthetic eyeball. What? Oh, right. The Stab series within these movies have taken on a life of their own, beginning with hints in Scream 2 and only continue to get weirder as the saga progresses. Oh. Knife of Doom and Ghostface Returns are chef's kiss satire. Clock of Doom was always my favorite. This threequels director is this dorky dipshit, Roman Bridger, played by Scott Foley. On top of his brother living in a van, Down by the river! and him having a name like a romance novel protagonist, he's not at all suspicious and certainly doesn't have a neon sign taped to his spine showcasing his true intentions. <laughs> that'd be silly. There's you there! He's discussing the shutdown with Lance Hendrickson and Roger fucking Corman. His name might not ring out to you like Spielberg or Hitchcock, but he's responsible for some of the most fascinating bits of cinema ever produced. And now he's here doing nothing. Checking in with this movie's body count, I mean bounty of characters, long gone are the high schoolers or even college cunts. This time is the cast of Stab 3, including the rebranded Randy, Tyson Fox, played by Dion Richman. Our discounted discounted Dewey is Matt Kiesler's Tom Prince, because my headcanon guesses this cheapo cash grab within this cheapo cash grab couldn't afford David Schwimmer again. At least you get David Schwimmer.
since he was busy in Aniston's crotch. There's also Sarah Darling, played by Jenny McCarthy, probably reading some horseshit about vaccines or Ventura. And finally, another recast in Emily Mortimer's Angelina Tyler, filling in for Sydney after Tori Spelling spelt sayonara. Gail gets to work at the same time dressed like Dick Tracy's Taylor as her doppelgangster Jennifer, played by Parker Posey, perks up in an equally appalling suit. And I, I don't mind you never returning my calls, but I have to tell you, after two films, I feel like I am in your mind. Mm, well, that would explain my constant headaches. She's certainly a beacon of light in this drab pile of shit. And I'm not just talking about how if Harry and Lloyd swung by to complete this suited Sharpie four-pack. April O-Negative goes to Bolt, but is blindsided by that rascal Riley. Kill. Who since parted ways with this poorly parted pussy and is now a technical advisor on set. And by that I mean he's putting it in Jennifer. Meanwhile, Lance Hendrickson screams that they have a strict no stupid haircut policy and Gail's thrown off set. Plus, if being meta and throwing it in your audience's face that you're watching a movie right now hasn't gotten tiresome yet, Jay and Silent Bob show up. It's a TV news shit, Connie fucking Chong! Why are they here? Will they have some triumphant return to stop or even be slashed by Ghostface? Will Kevin Smith ever fucking stop letting me down? Well, of course, because Weirdo Weinstein threw them in here to promote their upcoming Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, a movie that, uh, exists? It's hunting season. And, uh, has George Carlin saying this? Hey, if it'll get me a couple hundred miles across the country, I'll take a shot in the mouth. There's not a single other reason they're here. But hey, Wes Craven's behind them. Love that guy. Fucking Miramax, cut! While we've got Wes on the brain, we see the return of Sydney's father, played by Larry <laughs> who's so boring she goes right to sleep. Sleep, you say? Yeah, shockingly, it only took three of these things before Wes wanted to throw in a spooky nightmare sequence. Come here. Mother needs to talk to you. Mama Maureen's ghost floats in the window like Sid's at the cabin with Ash, but before Freddy can kill her, disguised as GF, she wakes up. Damn it, I already had I'm gonna woods bury you. Locked and loaded. Man, that has gotta be the worst one I've heard since the last one. Back at the back lot, our darling rolls up, regurgitating the same haha, third movie bad funny. Step three. Jesus, I gotta get a new agent. Knowing you're in a movie is one thing. Loathing the project you're working on is another. But calling the crap you churned out crap still makes it crap. Sarah slums about the office, shitting all over horror cliches, so we'll just, uh... And when she starts running lines with Roman, who's this dude, the director, and nothing else, suddenly, <laughs> he voice morphs into zombie ass. Oh wait. What movie? My movie. And it's called Sarah Gets Skewered Like a Fucking Pig. She also grabs her boob, which I just wanted to mention. Realizing it's the killer, she decides to scurry off and see if she can still get her old gig at Playboy back, but only finds a rack of ghost face costumes instead. I really enjoy this scene of Sarah playing hide and seek as the real guy reveals himself like he stole a stormtrooper suit. I'm Luke Skywalker, I'm here to rescue you. Even if her going to the closet instead of the exit makes zero sense. She shoved into the props room where all the knives could use a little blue pill, and before GF swears this has never happened to him before, he gets a stiffy back for a stab in the back. Wouldn't be the first time someone in Hollywood got stabbed in the back, both metaphorically and, well, we all know who produced it. Anyways, Dewey and Gale do a little cafe catch-up about how they've since broken up since the Dewinator's last run-in with several knife wounds. This team-up has always fascinated me, both in the series and in real life. They reportedly flirted on one, fucked on two, and filed for marriage a month before Scream 3's production pushed on. And they lived happily ever after, right? Yeah, buddy, you betcha. <clears throat> They rush over to Jennifer's place, who seems to be a couple wine bottles deep. Like I'm ever going to win an award playing you. Thankfully protected by Patrick Warburton. There's been a second murder. Sarah, darling. For all this flick's flaws, seeing Joe Swanson dressed like if Neo joined the cast of The Sopranos, kinda rocks. Oh God, I poop my pants. <laughs> it's funny when it happens to other people. Jen's paranoid since the killings are going in order of deaths from Stab 3, and that means Gale's next on the chopping block. The shoot's officially shut down, and the, again, not at all shady son of a bitch, 
Pierce is pinched and taken away. Gosh! That night, the cast has a little powwow in order to make killing them more convenient, especially since Gale goofs and winds up there too. Outside, Patrick Warburton investigate Dewdrops' trailer, presumably to see if he's got the Tick DVD box set, and takes a quick call from some deceiving Dewey impersonator. Is that an order, Dewdrop? Would I call you if it wasn't important? This is Buddy. <laughs> well, this is Kramer. I know. And I guess his role was a flash in the pan. Angry! As he's cronked like a Looney Tunes character. <laughs> Meh, what's up, Doc? <laughs> went from bodyguard to body bag. <laughs> More like Cobra can't. <laughs> the lights go out and <laughs> they start getting frightening faxes. Oh God. Rewriting the scene they're acting in. Just go with it. It only gets worse. Dewey is shockingly the smartest one in this scene, advising they get the fuck out of the house. But Teddy Prince Jr. just has to spoil the movie for himself like assholes online do every time one of these movies come out. Whoever, Whoever smells the This movie is seriously weak in the gore department. You have a house fucking explode like some long lost speed sequel, and you can't even scrounge up one leg prop to land at the character's free feet. Fuck! Nice sock. What I'm trying to say is like it reminds me of that table gag in Scary Movie, which came out three months after this, so no way they would know where there's like the gun, banana, <laughs> grenade. That's what this looks like. <laughs> the trio tumble over the Hollywood hillside with Gail winning the race and her prize consisting of a sneak attack. <laughs> nice to see Mountain Dew Baja blast his way out of this one. This near-death experience, and falling down forever like it's the opening to Freddy's Dead, really got D&G in the mood, making up by making out with a few hiccups. What ah! the fuck happened to you? Ah! Ah! But this love triangle trickery will have to wait as they find a third photo of Maureen P proclaiming to have killed her. But that was Billy Loomis and Stu Mocker, who... I don't think they can be called in for an interrogation. Or can they? <laughs> Dewey dials Sydney like a crazy ex, only for her to enter stage left for a warm reconnecting hug with D-Money and a third cousin family reunion hug for Gail. The killer called her. What? what do he say? What's know how you been, how you wanna die? The crafty killer called her earlier, and if it feels like she's a galaxy away from the story and characters in Scream 3, it's because she is. Nev Campbell, the beautiful and badass lead of the first two films, was a hot commodity. Wouldn't mind a shave. Oh, well, I wouldn't mind a blowjob from Nev Campbell. Concurrently shooting Party of Five and Drowning Mona while making this movie, meaning she was only around for three weeks and they had to work around her, above the relentless rewrites and tame down attempts. Oh, and best of all is the fact that she's wearing a wig due to her haircut and Drowning Mona. Let me get this straight. That's a wig, and it's still the second worst haircut in the movie. <laughs> Kincaid is immediately swooned by Sid, but she's not even remotely interested in McDreamy, as the pics of her mom make her more upset than me looking at Courtney's hair. Okay, okay, I'm done. That last scene had a notable lack of jump scares, so as Huey, Dewey, and Sydney shoot over to the studio, Dewey! Ah! Sorry! We meet, for the first time, Martha Meeks, played by Heather Matarazzo. There's something you guys should see. Told you I'd make a movie someday. Oh my god. That's right, this meek attempt to shove a Jamie Kennedy cameo shoehorned into the second act is a real bummer. The reason I'm here, and he's for real, because true trilogies... He's here to explain the end of a trilogy, which seems like they're really just tossing a Hail Mary. Killer who's gonna be superhuman. Anyone, including the main character, can die. This means you, Sid. The past will come back to bite you in the ass. Randy's death in 2 is such a kick in the nuts, even to this day. And they even tossed around the deliciously dumb idea to have the Meekster survive and be in witness protection. I wonder how desperate they'll have to get before Sarah Michelle Gellar returns as a head in a jar. Can't be much more than this. Good luck, Godspeed, and for some of you, I'll see you soon. Martha leaves the movie to go be saved by Batman. Save Martha! Why did you say that name? 
Ugh. And the Scooby Don't Gang split up with Jen and Gail making a quick pit stop to see Carrie Fisher. Oh, I mean, Bianca Burnett. I've been hearing it all my life. It's uncanny. I was up for Princess Leia. So who gets it? The one who sleeps with George Lucas. This has no bearing on the plot or anything really, but seeing Carrie Fisher playing a cynical, smoking version of herself makes the rest of this go by a little easier. You know, like a treat. She shows them the file on Maureen's moronic go at acting under the stage name Rena Reynolds, which would get really confusing if it was Carrie, considering her mom was Debbie Reynolds. And don't even get me started on their Philly family. I'm a recovering crackhead. This is my retarded sister that I take care of. Later, boners. Anywho, Sid's drinking straight from the tap like a total freak. <laughs> She's like scooping, it's fucking gross. <laughs> Only to uncover Angelina acting as a dark haired herring. So to get some action going, she scopes out the set of her recreated house. Even though she should just go back outside, she's swept away by the craftsmanship and requires a closer look. Would you settle, settle for a PG-13 relationship? relationship? I loved learning that this scene was unscripted and they only built the Prescott house because Wes thought it'd be cool and intended to add on to it later. The guy's a legend for a reason. With Sid Solo, that means the slasher's never too far behind, so they have a classic chase, except it's got a few extra Home Alone traps. Looking like the apartment Big Time Rush lived in, Swirly Slide excluded. <laughs> Put a swirly slide in my office. She appears to be having a mental breakdown. You didn't protect me. <laughs> but it's actually just the killer in one of the more creative Michael Myers cosplays I've seen. Give mommy a kiss and we'll make up. And flings herself onto that super soft ground turf that's one inch thick above the cement floor. Great. GF's gone, Sid and Kincaid want to get it on, and the rest of the team storms into Lance Hendrickson's office. Uh, do you know how many actors have worked for me? Who's been playing a sleazy movie producer. You want to get ahead in Hollywood? Unzip your pants and threaten career suicide. He explains that Maureen was involved in, try and believe this one, Hollywood parties full of drugs and sex. <laughs> now this is practically becoming science fiction. They head for his house, as he's the host of Director Roman's Bummer of a Birthday, but it does serve as a great location for a clumsy climax. Gail and Dewey Nabby discover a costume and that really, really stupid voice box. Dewey's got our voices. Even in these current times where AI-generated voices will allow us to have former presidents play Minecraft together and shit. Uh, even during global disaster, there's nothing like snuggling up to a new Confused Reviews episode. I remember the days when the only review I was confused about was, insert trendy joke here. Joe, you fucking idiot, you were supposed to ad lib on the script Luke gave you? Confused Reviews just makes good videos, no doubt about it. What? What is it we were talking about? I'm confused. Ooh, hot damn, I just found diamonds in the mine shaft. Enchanted books too. This is truly an epic gamer moment. Too bad we're way off topic. Uh, any of you see Scream 3? Scream 3, that's been the black sheep of those movies since G. Bush Jr. was in office. Yeah, but that, that Parker Posey was the uh, highlight of the picture. Uh, she keeps it afloat. Plus, our boy Dewey, the greatest character taking charge is awesome. Oh no, Anderman, fuck. And I told you not to go mining without us. Classic death move, Obama. I have not the slightest idea what's happening at this moment. Scream 3 had that silly voice changer. Good thing we don't need that crap. Even at its best, it doesn't sound one one hundredth as accurate as this trick or treat studios toy implies. He's got us all. And this was 23 years ago. Now that this do hickey demands no one can be trusted, Dewey and Gale go on the hunt and only find the fall of Rome. Is he dead? Oh, Mary! <laughs> Dewey! Roman's definitely dead. Might as well toss him in the fireplace right now, cause he's dead. Upstairs, they find Angelina, who was originally an accomplice killer in earlier versions of the movie, instead being left to do this. <laughs> Whoops. They find Doofenshmirtz, who gets a gnarly two-piece combo from Ghostface. <laughs> Poor guy's the pincushion of this series. <laughs> Tyson has his hero moment, but he just didn't know when to get off the stage and gets his rug pulled and turned into chicken nuggets. 
Also on the menu is Jennifer, who falls into this Willy Whackjob's haunted back rooms with two-way mirrors for that Weinstein seal of authenticity. Fucking sick fuck. It's just a shame they were a decade shy from seeing Cabin in the Woods unknowingly playing Ring Around the Rosy, Parker Full of Posey. Rip to the only new character that I liked. You can come out the killer stab through! Sid decides to show after getting a call that Dewey and Gale are being held hostage, and it's unfortunate he happened to bring his metal detector. All over Sydney, everywhere. Now take out the nipple rings. Inside the insane mansion, she finds the doo doo stain with a bonus Easy E backhand. <laughs> And when all hope seems lost, she pulls a nice guys and whips out the ankle gun. Did I dream that? Yeah, you moron. You dreamt it. He shot six ways to Sunday, but the Deus Ex diaper vest saves them. Finally, once and all unveiling, the true mastermind to be, this guy. Roman Bridger, director. Oh, Roman Bridger, no way! Who? Roman Bridger, director. Who? What? What? Roman Bridger, director. Like an Irish monk? What the fuck are you talking about? Roman Bridger, director. Who? Rookie Roman relays he's Sid's half-brother. And brother. And that Maureen was raped right here in this giant house. He was the result, and instead of growing up to torture teens in their dreams, now he's killing the cast of the movie he's been dying to make. Sounds logical if I've ever seen it. Really sticking that revenge to Sydney. The man who gave away your mother's innocence. Stupider still is the revelation he's the one behind Billy and Stu slaughtering Maureen. Great. Not only ruining one movie, they tried dragging the best one down with it. Ah! This is so poorly paced and paid off, I'd rather Wes have waited a year and gone with the less embarrassing Jay and Silent Bob crossover. All right, you bastard, let's see who you really are. Miramax, cut! I would have preferred that. While Roman drones on and on for the foreseeable future, because we always have to monologue for way too long, allow me to enlighten you on the original kooky killer that I don't know if I like more, but would have been a hell of a lot more enjoyable than this. I had to learn how to get pussy! <laughs> Before any of these bad ideas, Matthew Lillard was initially envisioned to return as the iconic Robin to Billy's Batman. Everyone's favorite Shaggy had signed on, been paid, and everything was ready to go for the story to follow an alive, incarcerated Stu be recruiting an army of high school ghost faces to run around terrorizing Sid and Co. I had actually been hired to come back in Scream 3 as the killer. However, as I mentioned earlier, this was back when senseless kid killings like Columbine were taken seriously, so they axed that idea for one infinitely worse. Honestly, though, I'd still be boggled how he survived this. Cause he got a, got a fucking TV dropped on his head. Sid plays Clue with the corny cutter, beating Colonel Mustard with the candlestick in the dining room. They roam and I mean roam around for a while, but two can play at this game, as I think Sid's experienced this enough to be as much a ninja as any of her enemies. So all it takes is a few stabs and a last second shooting scare Shoot him in the head. to blacklist the black robed bastard. So as we fade out into what is shot like a daydream sequence, Gail, Dewey, Derek Shepard, and Sid all gather around for a nice warm cut to credits, still making sure to literally leave the door open for more. Or maybe Prescott was hoping Ghostface would come back to give Gail a haircut himself. Haha, <laughs> got one more, bitch! And that was Scream 3, and it's like the third wheel on a bad date. It's there, it's awkward, and you just can't wait for it to be over. It's like the filmmakers ran out of ideas and just decided to throw in every horror cliche they could find, hoping something would stick. The only thing scarier than the killer in this movie is the fact that they managed to make three more sequels after this one. Oh, you love them. I do. If you're looking for a good laugh, though, Scream 3 delivers. Unintentionally, of course. I get that tensions were high and the news was trigger happy to blame the movies for real life violence, but could you imagine the scenario playing out for any other genre? 
You never hear a similar scenario play out at a comedy club, for example. Started blasting. Bah! Wow. Bah! Well, I don't see so good, so I missed. Then they ran away. I ran after them. And then the response be that comedies can no longer have jokes in them. This one's not all bad, though. David Arquette kills it in what I'd consider his leading man scream film. Honestly wished it had just followed him as he's in over his head but still uncovers the mystery. But why do that when you can have him comically fall down a hill? Twice! This whole flick is an interesting case study of the horror genre, fandom, and nostalgia. On the one fuck knife, every theatrical entry in the Scream saga is always going to have a few things. A-list celebrities slash cameos alongside the slasher, a batch of young adults who get hacked up, and they will always be sleek, well put together, and look professional. This may not make a whole lot of sense, but Scream is about as close a slasher flick can get to being a legit movie. Now before your fucking head explodes and you calmly inform me about what a fucking idiot I am, and that this looks good and that too, look at these two side by side and tell me Scream doesn't have that Hollywood polish. Class dismissed! No, no, it's only for five people! Okay, Luke, we've got it. The movies will always be well stitched together, but it still sucks, right? Well, what's strange is a few short years ago, there'd be zero debate. Scream 3 is the worst of the franchise. It's stupid, rushed, and relatively bland in its kills, killer, and Gale's haircut. Yet, here we are. These movies are alive and thriving, and people have seemingly come around on part 3. Which is crazy, because again, it is mid-range at best. However, it does allow us to circle back to the end of my opening remarks, because what that essentially means is that the first Scream trilogy is now officially nostalgic. No need to ever say there's anything wrong with these bad boys, because they've officially entered the realm of the rose-goggled nostalgia, a mysterious field where media goes from questionable to a bona fide work of flawless art. Ooh. Now I know, we've all got that media we cling to and that hopeful yearn of feeling that youthful glimmer again. No matter what decade satisfies that sentimental scratch always present in your head, Scream 3 still sucks. <laughs> it's the movie equivalent to driving five miles over the limit. Sure, it's got all the makings of a good time, but if they kept going in this direction, the next one would have been a huge fucking wreck. I'm going to give Scream Cubed... I'm Confused Reviews. <laughs> and as far as you're concerned... Fuck. I wonder what else he was planning on doing with this bullshit. Thanks for watching. Fuck. smells like the year 2000. Did you get a problem with Grey's Anatomy? No, I actually texted Tosh today asking for jokes about it. Speaking of incidents, oh, I hit the thing. This might be the horniest Scream movie I've come to realize. I think so. Oh, and here's another bad one. Went from... <laughs> Hello? Hello, Sydney.